We're talking vaccinations today. A lot of people get them shortly after birth, of course, again, before school starts and sometimes even later in life. Vaccines have actually been around for more than 200 years. Smallpox vaccine was created in 1796. And ever since then, vaccines were pretty much the same. They all used the virus itself in the vaccine. Yeah, that was until mRNA vaccines came along during COVID-19. And just the term mRNA got people pretty riled up. With mRNA vaccines came all sorts of widespread misinformation. There was talk about altering DNA in our bodies, the vaccine causing infertility, even putting a microchip inside of us. And while the technology was new to the general public, mRNA has actually been studied for more than 25 years. Hi, everyone. I'm Pete Kenworthy. And I'm A.C. Jepson, and this is Healthy at UH. mRNA is short for messenger RNA. And of course, thanks to COVID-19, this technology is now new to the public. But as Pete said, it is certainly not new to scientists. In fact, mRNA has been researched as far back as the early 90s. And modern medicine has some really big plans for it. This is exciting. That's what we're going to talk about today. Joining us to help understand how it works and what the future holds for mRNA-based treatments is Dr. Robert Salata, the Physician-in-Chief of University Hospitals in Cleveland, Ohio, and the Chair of the Department of Medicine at UH Cleveland Medical Center. Dr. Salata, thank you for being with us today. To give us some perspective on the science behind mRNA, how long have you been working with infectious diseases, and when did you first hear about this? I've been working in infectious diseases for over 30 years, um, and we've seen pandemics occur, the last of which was related to Uh, the 2009 time period when we saw the pandemic influenza outbreak, Uh, but we've never seen anything like this before. And the other important thing about this whole phenomena is how amazing and fast the information has been forthcoming. Uh, We, within two weeks of its first being described uh, out of China, we we knew the full uh, sequencing that is the makeup of the, the virus and moved from there. This led to the development of uh, vaccine technologies in a rapid fashion. But on the other hand, we keep saying no corners were cut. It was very important that this was done through an international effort. And the science, uh, I think, is what we base our decisions upon, including the use of vaccines for this uh, devastating pandemic right now. We obviously want to talk about how mRNA works. But first, let's start with how a viral infection works. What happens with our bodies when we get an infection? And specifically, what's going on with proteins? So the uh, role of a virus and its uh, goal in life, so to speak, is to make more virus. And it only can do that if it takes over the genetic machinery of our own cells and it attaches to and then gets inside of a cell and then takes over that uh, machinery to make more virus. That's really what happens. Every virus uh, targets different types of cells. And in the case of COVID-19, this is directed against our own respiratory cells, lining uh, the respiratory tract, et cetera, et cetera. But we know that this can disseminate widely through the body because uh, clinical manifestations are uh, such. Um, but it, it attaches to our own lining cells of the respiratory tract. It gets inside and then uh, makes more virus. Now, the key target or component, if you will, of this virus is what is called the spike protein. This, uh, we have shown pictures of the the spike protein, uh, but that's the projections off the surface of the virus. That allows it first to attach uh, to these respiratory cells and then be taken within it, and uh, the process then uh, takes over. So in retrospect, uh, during the early 2000s, when we knew about SARS-1, as well as subsequently the MERS virus, another coronavirus in the Middle East, we found that when people developed protective immune uh, responses against the spike protein, this was protective against subsequent infection. And indeed, 
The spike protein remains the major component of the virus that we target our vaccines upon. Uh, and in the cases of the mRNA, this is used to attach to uh, the spike protein of the virus, and then it uh, is delivered to the cells. It has protective layers because if you don't have that in place, some of which probably have been related to some of the allergic reactions, among other things, then this would be rapidly destroyed as soon as it's injected. Uh, therefore, it gets inside the cell because it has this protective layer. But once it does, that uh, is removed, and our own uh, cell, cell uh, products destroy the mRNA. So one of the things that people have been concerned about is whether or not uh, this uh, RNA, uh, genetic code, so to speak, is incorporated forever. And that is not the case. It is destroyed rapidly. But it delivers the goods, so to speak. So the spike protein then is expressed on the outside covering of the cells, and that's uh, what the immune system sees, and to which there are two types of immune responses that occurs. One is the so-called antibody response, which has been most written about, and that's very important. And the other are T cell responses. And these are even longer lasting, uh, and we don't know yet the full impact that these T cells have on protective immune responses, but they probably are very important in addition to the antibodies. So that's how this works. But viruses, and by the way, with your opening comments, uh, we also have uh, plenty of vaccines that are directed against bacteria as well. So all these microbes, and it's revolutionized uh, the whole approach to prevention of infection around the world. And this one, particularly with regard to the use of COVID vaccines, has done the same. So mRNA, it sounds like from what you were saying, it's almost like a delivery van, right? It comes in, it brings what you need into your body, and then it, and then it gets destroyed, right? So how does that compare to the vaccines we were used to, right? We, we were used to when you were injected with the dead or the weakened virus, like the flu vaccine, right? So how is that different from, from mRNA vaccines? Well, it's this unique delivery system that's uh, very uh, different in terms of what we've seen before. But because we can deliver the goods, as I said before, get them expressed on the very cells that are the targets uh, for the infection, uh, this really has uh, been a revolutionary approach in terms of how we've uh, approached vaccinology. And uh, we'll talk about this later, but there are many applications of this technology now that we know it works, and it's uh, well tolerated for the most part uh, in terms of other infectious diseases and even outside of infections, how we might use the, the such technology. But previously, if you look at like the flu vaccine or other vaccines yep. that used dead or weakened virus, how, how did that work? Just so I understand the difference. In a similar way, um, again, it would uh, cause an immune response, but not so elegantly as this does with regard to uh, being incorporated into the very cells which are the basis for the infection of the COVID-19. Uh, so that makes it different. Whereas in these other cases, we're just relying upon uh, the vaccine, you know, even without it being delivered on those very cells uh, to the immune system, and you get uh, immune responses that way. So uh, this really has uh, been a, a major advancement, I think, in terms of uh, vaccines and will be applied in other circumstances. Yeah. And because it's so targeted, we hear about this 95%, you know, 95% of people who got it are, are protected. And, and you talk about the flu vaccine, and right, you're talking 30 to 50%, right? right. So, so it's a game changer. It is. I really want to talk to you about this influenza and this being a game, ch game changer. And we're going to get to that in just a moment. But let's go back to what you said about changing DNA. I think it's really important for us to stress this because that's what we've been hearing. And yet people still say, uh-uh. How do, you, how do you know? So, so let's discuss that and any other myths that concern you, doctor. Well, this is an important uh, point uh, because many people still live with the idea that this is changing our genetic makeup. 
Uh, this is an RNA, so it's different from DNA, so it has nothing to do with that. There are other vaccines in the COVID armamentarium, uh, such as the AstraZeneca vaccine that's used outside the United States, but also Johnson & Johnson, which are DNA-based viruses. Uh, and it's using uh, another virus called adenovirus to deliver the goods uh, into which uh, the uh, genetic material from the COVID virus is packed or inserted. Uh, so this does not change DNA in any shape and form. As I said, it's destroyed. We've looked at uh, this in animal models and also in the initial volunteers uh, that have uh, uh, received the vaccine for any telltale sign of, the, of any remaining RNA, messenger RNA. We've also looked at transmission through the placenta and women who are uh, pregnant. Uh, so we have not seen any of this happening. And um, for that matter, many of the other myths, since you're talking about this, Macy, related to infertility, et cetera, were suppositions by a few sci uh, uh, so-called scientists about this phenomena, but it's never been shown to be the case. So it has been studied extensively now, and over 20,000 women particularly if given in the third trimester, and it's not been shown to affect any element of the reproductive uh, capacity in these women uh, then or subsequently. So we mentioned this is not new technology, that it started in the early 90s and was since studied to fight things like you mentioned influenza, Ebola, SARS, but it didn't work out then for those. Why not? Why didn't it work before? I, I don't think we had all the technology down at that time. Plus, we have to be uh, really cognizant of the type of infectious agent we are dealing with. We have subsequently had more successful vaccines against Ebola, for instance. We use influenza vaccines all the time, although we're still searching for one that will be given uh, and uh, will be effective over a much longer period of time than on an annual basis. In part, and this applies to COVID as well. Uh, we see changes in the influenza virus all the time. And that um, change or mutation with influenza can be sometimes subtle or major. And if it's major and not a great many people have been exposed to that form before, we are set up for an epidemic, which happened in 2009. Let's, let's fast forward to 2017, um, there were human trials underway for mRNA vaccines, HIV, influenza, Zika, rabies. Scientists were moving the needle at, at that time, it seems. Was it because those human trials were already underway that science was able to move so quickly for COVID-19 vaccines? I mean, I imagine quick funding had a little bit to do with it as well. Quick and ample funding uh, was an important step in that regard. Uh, and also cooperation among many, many countries and scientists around the world. Uh, but because this technology was already advanced to a point, we were able to take advantage of that, all that previous work, and uh, incorporate that into the design of mRNA-based um, cro coronavirus vaccines. So it sounds pretty awesome, really, what, what science is able to do here. And, and looking at the future of mRNA vaccines and treatments, we mentioned human trials already underway, right? HIV, rabies, influenza. But I've also read about malaria, tuberculosis, hepatitis B, cystic fibrosis. I mean, it sounds truly amazing, but is it? I mean, are the possibilities really limitless for this technology? We have to take baby steps here. Uh, yes, the technology is really easy to work with. And if you want to change it from one bacterial or viral process to another, you can do that relatively easily. We are going to undertake relatively soon uh, a trial, phase one trial, which is the earliest form of human investigation for uh, vaccines and other products like that, where we're going to be mainly focused on safety and looking at an influenza vaccine that is linked to the mRNA technology. And uh, we think this may provide the opportunity to have a more effective vaccine because of how this works again which we discussed before. Because as you mentioned, Pete, the efficacy rate on an annual basis of flu vaccine is on the order of 30 to 50%. We need to improve that. 
We've been talking a lot about viral infections, so I may be off base here, but I just, this seems like the superstar of the future, so we, I have to ask about cancer treatments. Is that even on the horizon? So to have targeted treatments for cancer is really what we want to do, and therefore avoid all the so-called collateral damage that occurs with our own cells in our body that is rapidly uh, uh, dividing. And that's what happens with current chemotherapeutic regimens, that there are other cells that are bystanders of the effect. So if we can target this more so, and we're doing some of that now with immune-based therapies in the context of cancer, this will be revolutionary. And mRNA was first being developed at the outset for the purposes of cancer therapeutics. So I think we'll see a return to that. Uh, and I am saying right now that uh, some of the folks originally involved in the development of the mRNA technology, including then and now, will likely be Nobel Prize winners in the end. Wow. That's incredible to think about. Yeah. I- I'm guessing, and you mentioned ample funding when we said funding, but but I'm guessing th- that's a huge part of it, right? I mean, for, for any of this development, it was the funding, the ample funding you mentioned, was quickly available during a global pandemic. Obviously, every, everybody was on the same page there. But for these other things that we mentioned, the whole world may not be working together as we did during COVID-19. Is that the stumbling block for whether it's for cancer or hepatitis B, cystic fiber, any of these things? Is the stumbling block the funding or is it the technology itself or both? Uh the funding will be a challenge, but I think as this has been so successful in the context of COVID vaccine development, that you'll see a, a significant willingness by the funders, including the National Institutes of Health, to make uh, the, these resources available for further development. Well, one thing is certain, mRNA is not a foreign term to the public anymore, and the future looks bright for use in a lot of ways. Dr. Robert Salata, physician-in-chief at University Hospitals in Cleveland and the chair of the Department of Medicine at UH Cleveland Medical Center, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Macy and Pete. And remember, you can find and subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. Search University Hospitals or Healthy at UH, depending on where you subscribe. For more health news, advice from medical experts, and Healthy at UH podcasts, just go to uhhospitals.org slash blog.